Now we're going to look at the chapter on personality and personality assessment. Now in the previous two chapters, we outlined how social and developmental processes contribute to various or variations in behavior across people. This chapter extends that discussion to examining personality. Now personality is a, um, a unique collection of attitudes, emotions, thoughts, habits, impulses, and behaviors that define how a person typically behaves across situations. Now let's use an example here. Beth is willful, curious, and insecure about her appearance. Her husband, Barry, well, he's compromising, resourceful, and sociable. Now, some of their children are more outgoing and independent, whereas others are more quiet and, and unassuming. Perhaps your family has a similarity, a similarity in terms of the varies, variability of people seeming, excuse me, like a cast of actors put together in an off-Broadway play. So how can we understand these similarities and differences in personality? This is the focus of this chapter as we're going to explore this uh, critical question. How do we develop our personalities and how stable or changeable are they? Now psychologists don't agree on a single specific answer to this question. Personality is difficult to define. It's difficult to measure and influenced by many factors, such factors as the four dominant scientific perspectives have emerged to explain our personalities. And we're going to look at these, the psychoanalytic approach and the trait approach, the social cognitive approach and the humanistic approach. Now, no single approach can explain all facets of personality in all people and each perspective has advantages and disadvantages. And as we describe each approach, consider your own ideas about personality. Do you think you inherit your personality or is it formed through your life experiences? Examining such ideas speaks to whether you think personality is stable and consistent over time or whether it can change and be malleable over time. So let's get started. We're going, to we're going to begin in the psychoanalytic and psychotherapy sort of side of things, and we'll begin with the three levels of awareness in Freud's theory of consciousness. Now, we've seen this image before uh, when we looked at the very beginning and looked at theoretical perspectives, and we've touched on it throughout. The three levels of awareness in consciousness are the conscious, the pre-conscious, and the unconscious. Now, the unconscious is the most important level of consciousness, um, and it's the primary motivating factor or force to our behavior. It holds memories that are too unpleasant or anxiety-provoking to be in the conscious mind. The unconscious contains all instincts, wishes, desires, and have never been allowed to come to consciousness. Now, this is Freud's perspective. Now, the unconscious can be revealed in dreams, and sometimes what are known as the Freudian slips of tongue. Now the pre-consciousness, this is the level of, my, uh, of the mind which um, information is available, but not currently conscious. It's similar to the concept of long-term memory. It holds all the memories, experiences, and perceptions that we may not consciously be thinking about at any one given moment but these can be brought to consciousness more quickly. And then three is the consciousness or conscious state. And this consists of what we are aware of, our thoughts, sensations, feelings, and memories at any particular given time in our life. So right here and now would be my consciousness about here I am sitting in my studio in my basement uh, making a video for you guys. That's my conscious state. Now Freud also introduced um, the roles of the id, the ego, and the superego. And again, this three systems, um, three systems of concept of personality are consistent through what, core, um, what Freud has been introducing throughout this course for us. 
Now the id is the primitive, unconscious part of the personality, which contains the instincts that op and operate on the pleasure principle. Now the pleasure principle is about immediate gratification and the avoidance of discomfort. The ego is the rational, uh, largely conscious system which operates according to the reality principle. Now the ego mediates between the id and the superego. The conflict be between the demands of the id and the rules and the restrictions of the superego lead to anxiety for the ego. So the superego holds all the rules and restrictions of what society expects and the social expectations. The id drives all the, you know, the, the primitive and um, pleasure-based um, thoughts, feelings, and ideas. And the ego negotiates what things get through and what things do not. And what happens with this degree of anxiety that the ego can experience is that they'll often rely on, or Freud would suggest, would use um, defense mechanisms to deal with the anxiety. And we'll come back to that in a moment. The superego, this is the moral system of the personality, and it consists of the consciousness of the ego ideal. Okay, now, things might not, or things might go well if these systems all work together in support of one another. However, because they don't, Freud introduced the role of defense mechanisms. And here we're reintroducing it again. When the ego is not able to offset the id or the superego. Now you'll see I'll post it there and behind me this. The defense mechanisms, these are unconscious, irrational um, means that the ego uses to defend against anxiety and to maintain self-esteem. It involves self-deception and distortion of reality. These aren't always reliable and good. They can just be something that we use to avoid dealing with something else. Now, a defense mechanism is a means used by the ego to defend against anxiety and to maintain self-esteem. The defense mechanism are especially important when the ego is forced or chooses to violate the superego's rules. So if we use these defense mechanisms, particularly when we're struggling with accepting more of the id and disregarding some of the superego's restrictions. Now, all people use defense mechanisms to some degree. Overuse can adversely affect mental health. Overuse can adversely, sorry, can adversely affect mental health. Now, some defense mechanisms are repression, projection, denial, rationalization, and regression. Now, you'll see those on the chart behind me. Now, Freud introduced another component, and again, it Freud's um, contributions were affected a large part by. Um, the lack of empirical research that he did. And this falls in that line where a lot of the f researchers that followed Freud didn't really subscribe to this section or this component of his personality theory and where he introduced what he called psychosexual stages. Now you'll find the details in your textbook for each of the stages and I've got a little image there and behind me there. Now here he notes that a child could develop a fixation at a particular stage. And according to Freud, Freud, sorry, fixations refer to the arrested development or the slowed redevelopment that can happen at a psychosexual stage due to the excessive gratification or frustration that a child may experience at that stage of development. Now Freud believed that personality is almost completely formed by age five or six. The edible uh, conflict is resolved and the superego is formed. Personality is influenced by one, the traits that develop because of fixations at any development, the traits that, that develop because of these fixations at any psychosexual stage, and two, the relative strength of the id, the ego, and the superego. Now, in psychologically healthy people, there is a balance among these three components. If the id is too strong and the superego too weak, people will, cease, will satisfy their desires with no feeling of guilt, no matter who they hurt or what the cost. If the superego is too strong, it will create perceptual guilt preventing a person from enjoying sensual pleasures. Excuse me just a moment. 
Uh, okay. Now, a student of Freud, and we're going to look at this guy next, is Carl Jung. Now, Carl, uh, he didn't support Freud's sexual instinct, or the personality was mostly achieved by age five or six. Jung saw a particular importance to middle age on personality development, that personality wasn't solid early, that it continued to develop, and then there was a particular important point in time in middle age where personality continued. Now, Jung did describe three components or parts of personality. The first was ego. This is a conscious component of personality and carries out our daily activities. Now, the personal unconscious, which is the second part, it contains all the experiences, the thoughts, um, and the perceptions accessible to the conscious, as well as repressed memories, wishes, and impulses, like a combination of Freud's pre-conscious and unconscious put, put together into what Jung called personal unconscious. And then his third level was collective unconscious. Now, for Jung, the collective unconscious was the deepest and most inaccessible layer of unconsciousness. It contains the universal experience of all humankind, such as the myths, the dreams, symbols, and religious beliefs. Also contained archetypes. Now, these are inherited tendencies to respond to universal human situations in a particular way. He would describe, you know, humans' fear of dark or... Uh, apprehension about stakes and spiders as being archetypes handed down generation from generation as memories if you will uh, to protect humankind now the collective unconscious contains archetypes as was mentioned inherited tendencies to respond to these universal human situations in a particular way he believed that our tendency to believe in god the devil evil spirits and heroes and even have a fear of the dark reflect these archetypes we didn't necessarily have to have previous experiences, his point. Now, we can also introduce Alfred Adler's theories of personality, and we can compare and contrast Alfred's uh, perspective with that of Freud's. Now, both Freud and Adler believe that personality has different levels, namely an, a conscious level and an unconscious level. Now, both theorists believe that we must overcome struggles to attain certain goals and that the issues in childhood could impede the development of personality. Adler, however, disagreed with much of Freud's theory. Contrary to Freud, Adler believed that behavior is motivated more by the conscious than the unconscious. Now, that certainly is a departure from Freud. Now, Freud believed, for number two, uh, as a comparator, Freud believed that differences in personality result from a relative strengths of the id, the ego, and the superego, whereas Adler emphasized the unity of personality rather than its separate components of id, ego, and superego. Thirdly, Freud believed that personality traits developed as a result of problems during psychosexual stages. Adler believed that we are more motivated um, by future goals than early childhood experiences. And that's a huge departure. So rather than looking to the past as an explanation for personality currently and in the future, as in Freud's case, Adler was saying that we have less concerns about where you know our childhood experiences lead us and more about where we have aspirations or are motivated by what might be future goals that we could have. And then fourthly, Whereas Freud believed that sex and pleasure-seeking are our primary motives, Adler maintained that the predominant force of personality is the drive to overcome and compensate for feelings of weaknesses and inferiority and to strive for superiority and significance. To Adler, the inferiority complex describes very strong feelings of inferiority that may impede the development of our personality. He also described a style of life as a unique way people move through their childhood to adulthood struggling to achieve superiority. And so from Adler's perspective, he's looking at ways in which we continue to strive to be better. Now, 
by not measuring up to these expectations, we might feel a sense of inferiority and that our goal throughout life is to try to work hard with the particular style of life, the way we approach conflict, the way we approach um, barriers, the way we approach success. Our style of life will have a big impact on whether and how we pursue, how we pursue um, success or uh, superiority throughout our life. Now, another person in the same sort of genre of psychoanalysis is Karen Horney. Now, Karen, she needed, uh, she indicated that we need safety and satisfaction to be psychologically healthy. To attain these, we need to develop coping strategies in childhood. And as these will form our basic attitudes towards life. Now, we can move toward people. That's one attitude of life, moving toward people moving against people, or moving away from people. Now, if we're normal, then we will move in all three ways as needed to a specific situation. So having the ability to be flexible in knowing when to move toward, when to move against, and when to move away. Now, that's been the sort of psychotherapeutic class of discussion. We're going to move next into trait theories of personality. Now, no doubt you've heard the term traits, personality traits. So these theories are falling along those lines. Now, a trait is a stable and consistent personal characteristics that is used to describe and explain personality. Trait theory of personality are attempts to explain personality and differences between people in terms of their uh, personal characteristics. Now, one of the first that we'll look at is Gordon Alport. Now, Gordon, he identified two main categories of traits, common and individual traits. Now, common traits were those traits we share or hold in common with most others of our culture. All right, but far more important to Alport were the three types of individual traits. One, the cardinal trait, a, person, a personal quality that is so strong that in people's person, you know, part of it, so start all over again. The cardinal trait was a personal quality that is so strong uh, of a part of this person's personality that he or she may become identified with that trait or known for it. Now I have Abe Lincoln here the cardinal trait was that, you know, what we know of Abe Lincoln, if we were to sort of generalize, would be that it was, you know, the acronym or the, the um, moniker of Honest Abe. You know, that, that is something that supersedes all elements about Abe Lincoln. That's a cardinal trait. Now, most of us have something of that. If we were to look at some of our friends, what was the one most important thing that we could say about them? Personality-wise, that would be something we, would, we might call a cardinal trait. The second type of trait here would be a central trait. Now these traits uh, you would mention in writing a letter of recommendation. If you were to do that, write a letter of recommendation from somebody, you would be identifying their central traits, things that make up who they are. And then thirdly is secondary traits. These are less obvious, less consistent, not as critical in defining our personality, but they include things like our food preferences, music, you know, what we consider our favorite music, and specific attitudes. Now, another theorist in the trait area is Raymond Cattell, and he describes surface or source traits. Surface traits refer to observable qualities of personality, which you might use in describing a friend. Things you can see, not things you think about. Source traits underlie the surface traits. They exist in all of us in varying degrees. They make up most basic personality structures and um, structure and causes of behavior. Now, Cattell, he found or described 23 source traits and he studied 16 in particular detail, creating what he calls his 16 personality factor questionnaire. Um, and that's been around for some time. So the PF16 is his research piece um, of assessment for personality factors. Now following him, we have Hans Eisnick. 
Now he believed personality was genetic or genes based and very minimal environmental factors played a role. He identified three of the most important dimensions of psychology. And you'll see that on the screen there behind me. You have psychoticism. Here, an individual's link to reality. This is what psychoticism is. And with extreme ranges from psychosis on the far side, these are people who live in a world of hallucinations, delusions, to those who thought, whose thought process is very rigid, rigidly tied to the material world who, who lack creativity. So there's this range. And we'll find the same sort of range with the second uh, grouping. Extroversion, which is extroversion on one side, introversion on the other. Extroverts are sociable, outgoing, and active, whereas introverts are more withdrawn, quiet, and introspective. Now it's important to note, um, it's not better being on one side of the spectrum or the other side. It's just to suggest that people equally successful in life can be on anywhere on this continuum. And so that's how he works this. Neuroticism versus emotional stability is the third. Unstable or neurotic people are anxious, excitable, and easily distressed, whereas emotionally stable people are calm, even-tempered, and more easygoing. Now, we can see from his work that uh, McRae and Costa came up with initially what was called the five-factor theory of personality, and it posited that personality can be best described as five broad dimensions. If you could imagine taking a paintbrush and making five different colors going across your your paper, those would be broad strokes, no detail, but that's what they described as these broad dimensions of the big five factors. So let's look at them each individually. Openness to experience is the first broad uh, stroke. Open to experiences, more imaginative, intellectually curious, and broad-minded versus someone who is more concrete-minded, practical, and narrow in their interests. Now, again, it's important to note that depending on what, where you fall on this continuum, both can be particularly useful. It kind of depends on your style of life, if we weren't going back to Adler. But looking at the sort of someone who is open to experiences and imaginative and intellectually curious will do certain kinds of jobs in life where those are required, where there are other people who need to be more concrete-minded and practical and narrow in their interests for the kind of career interests that they have. These are not to say one is better than the other. These are to say these are personality traits. And you can be successful in any number of them. So that's one, openness to experience. Two, conscientiousness. Now here, high conscientiousness, people are dependable, organized, reliable, responsible, thorough, hardworking, preserving, versus someone who is lower on this where they might be less dependable, more disorganized, impulsive, unreliable, irresponsible, careless, negligent, and even considered lazy. Now, you can certainly see where there seems to be a more desirable and less desirable side to this, but all of these things, wherever we fall, help contribute to our uniqueness of personality. Um, number three, extroversion. Now, as mentioned earlier, in his work, extroverts were sociable, outgoing, talkative, assertive, persuasive, decisive, and active versus introverts who are more withdrawn, quiet, passive, retiring, and introspective. The fourth of the big, four, of big five is agreeableness. From pleasant, good-natured, warm, sympathetic, and cooperative to the lower side of unfriendly, unpleasant, aggressive, argumentative, cold, hostile, and vindictive. Now, we might not want to identify ourselves by any of these characteristics on the lower side. However, we all have variable degrees depending upon the situation that we're in, the people we're around, and what we're asked to be a part of can all contribute to this variability. And the fifth big factor is neuroticism. Now here, emotional stability versus instability is of issue. The instability experience more negative emotions, moody, irritable, 
nervous, and worry a bit more, whereas someone with more stable emotional uh, ability, they have uh, calmness, even-tempered, easygoing, and relaxed. Now, these, what we've done is looked at sort of the initial starting of our look at personality. And when we get into part two, this is the end of part one, so when we get into part two, we'll look at some of the additional theories that look at um, uh, personality and where we get it from. Plus, in part two, we're going to look at the uh, assessment of personality. All right, so I hope this has been helpful. I hope it's a good start. Let's keep up the good work, everybody. Bye now.